Hi everyone, the AI arms race is playing out not just between companies, but also between nations. In fact, the political maneuvering behind the largest national players may have a dramatic effect on the future development of AI. Will the semiconductor cold war bring innovation to a halt? Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts. Why countries care about AI, digital sovereignty, and the semiconductor cold war. Part one, why countries care about AI. The obvious answer, if you've listened to Jeffrey Hinton at all, is that there are a lot of military applications for AI. You can build smarter drones, smarter cyber weapons, and have better overall strategy. And even the military applications alone would be enough to ensure that countries were putting their finger in the pie, so to speak. But there's far more than that because AI will have a massive economic impact over the next couple of years. One estimate published by the New York Times estimates the annual economic growth at about 4.4 trillion US dollars. That's roughly 4% of global GDP as it stands today. But here's the rub. Those benefits will not be spread evenly across all the countries in the world. As you might be able to guess from technology in general, whoever produces and owns the technology gets the majority of the benefits. And AI is a particularly extreme example because training is very difficult and expensive. That means it's a winner-take-all domain because most entities, whether companies or countries, don't really have the resources to compete with the top player in the market. The fact that inference is really cheap and easy in comparison only exacerbates this problem. It's very similar to the pharmaceutical industry, where you have a huge upfront research cost and then the actual production of a drug is not that expensive. But of course, the legal system, particularly in the US, has evolved to really support these pharmaceutical companies because they have such a massive impact on the economy. And those companies have very little trouble maintaining a global grip on the production of their drugs. It's pretty clear that AI will lead to automation and job loss, which will necessitate some kind of economic transformation in a lot of countries. I actually made a video about this topic previously, so you can check it out over here if you're interested. Although there's been some discussion about universal basic income and whatnot, it doesn't seem to be very serious yet, and countries aren't focused on that. They're still focused on the initial problem of trying to get a slice of the AI pie. One way, of course, that a country or a jurisdiction can be assured of this is to remove barriers for companies, enacting laws that make it easy to grab training data from the internet, for example, and creating outright tax benefits and subsidies for a company to set up shop at a certain jurisdiction. Just like when Amazon started a bidding war for its second headquarters, which didn't really end up materializing, but anyways. All this means that the tech companies are becoming more and more powerful and can ask for more and more resources from its government. And actually, the country that a company is from is becoming more and more important in terms of the market it will be able to access, in terms of the raw resources it will be able to obtain, and in terms of the labor market as we see the world slowly starting to become a little bit less open and a little bit less focused on free trade. Part two, digital sovereignty. As I mentioned, the world is moving away from full globalization under the US-led international order and seems to be developing into some partitions where countries are a little more aware of their supply chains and their potential vulnerability to future sanctions that might be imposed on them or that they might have to impose on other countries. The pandemic, of course, highlighted this because there were lots of supply chain disruptions and everyone became acutely aware that there were a handful of places around the globe that were producing very important materials and resources. But I think an even bigger push came when Russia invaded Ukraine. Because if you just have a trade war going on between the US and China, for example, your goods and services that you're trying to obtain internationally might become more expensive, but they rarely get cut off completely. But if we're back in the era where countries may militarily invade each other, then that represents an abrupt cutting of the supply chain across industries. Or it can, as happened when a lot of different countries started sanctioning Russia. So what does all this mean in terms of AI? Well, it means that countries want to have their own AI models. This makes good sense, not just from a supply chain perspective, but also because any data set that's used to train an AI system, particularly a really big AI system, like a large language model, is going to have a lot of inherent biases in it. And those biases from the data set, although they can be corrected if the AI researcher knows that they're there, they will often make it into the final product. I've even had European friends tell me that ChatGPT sounds American, whatever that means. Some countries have been taking steps for a while to make sure that their data is secured and safely within the country's own borders. For example, the EU enacted the infamous GDPR for data protection that applies to all citizens of the European Union, even if that data is being accessed and stored by an American company, for example. Even Canada, where I live, has its own data protection laws and has had for many years. Public institutions, including universities, can't force students to use a service that's not hosted in Canada if it's used for certain purposes like grades or assignments and so on. 
so on. So sometimes professors have to take alternative methods or use systems that are actually hosted in Canada instead. China, meanwhile, plans to be fully self-sufficient across all industries by the year 2025. Their slogan is Made in China 2025. At least that's the goal. It's a very ambitious one because China has to import a lot of raw materials and food and so on. Specifically in the realm of AI though, China has a couple of advantages. First, they don't care as much about individual rights and privacy, so technology like facial recognition tends to be rolled out everywhere, literally everywhere. When I visited Shanghai, every time that there was something crossing the road like traffic lights, there would be cameras on those traffic lights that were doing license plate recognition. And in the city proper, the cameras would also be identifying people. Every person in China basically has a WeChat account with a picture there, and the cameras can identify when you jaywalk across the street and then they will figure out that it's you and they will automatically find you. In fact, in some places there are even screens, big displays on the sides of the road that will light up with your picture and your information there when you jaywalk to try to shame everybody into good behavior on the street. All that to say that China doesn't mind pushing out new technology very rapidly, even somewhat forcibly to all of their citizens and then they're able to get a ton of data from that. So quick adoption of new AI technology and also a greater wealth of data that can be used to train those AI technologies. Meanwhile, the European Union is really concerned about over-reliance on US technology. The EU in general has some problems keeping and attracting talent because of low pay and really just not a lot of different positions compared to North America. The US, as the only economy not devastated by World War II, emerged as the dominant superpower eventually and spread its military throughout the world, trying to get everybody aligned with US interests by forcing globalization everywhere. In a sense, they didn't really care about digital sovereignty at the time. Well, I mean, there wasn't much digital, but they didn't care much about technological sovereignty at the time because there were even greater advantages to having an integrated world market, one with the US as the police force and the bank. So it used to be a pretty neutral player in terms of technology. Researchers would come from all over the world to the U.S. universities, which got the most funding and did the best research. And the U.S. kind of got used to that and started noticing that a lot of industries had left the U.S. to go to cheaper countries, started worrying about that, started putting tighter border restrictions in place, and started to get worried about other countries catching up as their own economies took off. Now the U.S. is acting very much in its own self-interest, as we'll talk about more in a bit. Part 3. The Semiconductor Cold War Although semiconductors and microchips have made the news a fair amount recently, you still may not have heard of the 10th largest company in the world by market cap, which is TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. TSMC is at the center of a giant web, a global supply chain of all the stuff necessary to produce really advanced, high quality chips. And the reason you haven't heard of TSMC is that it's business to business only. Companies like Apple, Nvidia, and AMD outsource all of their chip manufacturing to TSMC, which currently has about a 90% market share of top-end chip manufacturing. TSMC represents an example of companies specializing. Originally, tech manufacturing companies were vertically integrated. For example, IBM and Texas Instruments would manufacture all their own microchips. But eventually, that whole system became so complicated that it made more sense to split the manufacturing half of the business, the low-level half of the business, out into a separate organization, and the higher-level half of the business, which was actually just doing the chip designs, would remain as a separate company. You probably remember the recent battles between Intel and and AMD to produce the best performing Intel compatible chips for computers and laptops. And Intel is sort of unique in that they still manufacture their own CPUs, but they were having a lot of trouble transitioning between one manufacturing process and the next newer process, while AMD just went straight to TSMC, which was doing all the manufacturing of basically every other chip in existence, and so had the expertise and the economies of scale, where the scale is the whole world, to actually do that more efficiently. Of course, AMD also had a ton of innovations in the design component, but the fact that they were actually able to outsource their production to TSMC also gave them a leg up on Intel. The formation of TSMC is fascinating. There's basically one guy that had worked in the semiconductor industry in the US, who eventually became disillusioned and decided to just go to Taiwan out of the blue, ask for money, and founded the entire industry there in Taiwan, which was not a very advanced economy at the time. I watched a 30-minute documentary on it, which I'll link to in the description below because it's fascinating if you want to dive into it yourself. Now, the semiconductor industry, which is basically TSMC, makes up 15% of Taiwan's economy. And to give you an idea of the amount of money that TSMC has to spend on research and development that it, that it can amortize over the whole world of chips, last year, TSMC spent 
5% of the country's entire GDP on research and development for a new set of factories that they're making, a new fab. That's right, 5% of the entire country's GDP. These days, TSMC is starting to build fabs in other countries, including the US, Germany, and Japan, but they represent only a small fraction of the total manufacturing capability of the company. And part of the reason for that is that Taiwan just makes so much sense. It's right next to China, so the chips, as soon as they're manufactured, can be shipped to China, assembled into whatever end user electronics you could imagine, and then shipped around the world. Of course, with the increased competition between countries and the US and China in particular really not trading anymore, their, their trade has really fallen off a cliff in the past few years. It's unclear for how long that will continue to be as beneficial as it has been in the past. But TSMC has such a lead. The only other players in the game that can produce leading edge chip technology are Samsung and Intel. In 2020, most of them were on a five nanometer process. And then as of mid or late 2022, Samsung and TSMC are now on a three millimeter process, meaning it's smaller, so it's more efficient, it can produce chips that are faster and use less power. Intel's hoping to switch to three nanometer this year sometime, and TSMC has two nanometer in development for the end of next year. All of this really worries countries that are not allied with Taiwan or South Korea, by which I mean China, especially because the US might try to prevent China from having access to this technology. The US has already successfully blocked EUV machines from being delivered to China. EUV stands for Extreme Ultraviolet Lithography, which as you might imagine is a very specialized type of technology, which is only produced by one company in the whole world in the Netherlands. So China doesn't have access to that critical tool for very modern chip manufacturing, like five nanometer and smaller. However, the Chinese chip manufacturers have actually been exceeding expectations. One of them, SMIC, actually produced a seven nanometer process a few years ago, but they didn't even announce it. This is because SMIC has really close ties to the Chinese military. And so it's sort of like part of the Chinese industrial military complex. And the only reason we know about it is that someone took some Bitcoin miners that had been produced in SMIC and examined the chips to figure out that they were actually built on a seven nanometer process. So very interesting. And it's causing a lot of conflict and tension between these different countries because China can't access the technology it needs and it knows it can't rely on these more Western oriented countries. Meanwhile, the US is really worried because Taiwan is so close to China and at risk of being invaded. And they're getting basically all of their microchip manufacturing know-how and physical construction happening in Taiwan. And I don't know what Europe is doing. They had ARM based in the UK, but they allowed ARM to be bought by SoftBank, a Japanese conglomerate. So who knows? Anyway, the biggest rivalry is definitely between the US and China. And at the end of 2022, the US decided to classify microchip manufacturing as critical to national security. There's already a law in place that prevents Americans from working for the militaries of foreign governments or substantially contributing to something that could, I guess, be used against the US. And anyway, they just expanded that definition to include microchips. And they basically offered an ultimatum to any Americans that were working in China. The US government said, you're in violation of our laws now, and you could go to prison for that. So basically, they had to choose between their US citizenship and continuing to work for the Chinese company. So what happened was basically a huge portion of the American engineers and managers that were working in Chinese companies and helping develop CPU and microchip technology just quit overnight, which is a big problem for China because they were relying on that existing technical know-how to get them up to speed. So that's why I say the US isn't really being neutral anymore. That was a pretty strong action and it really puts the Chinese companies at a disadvantage. Hard to say where it will go from here, but all we can hope is that it doesn't lead to all-out war, especially over Taiwan. All right, finally, in conclusion, a lot of countries are really concerned about AI technology and trying to keep as much of it within their borders as possible, handing out incentives to tech companies to keep things onshore, trying to accumulate their own data sets so that they can train their own models that are not subject to the bias from other countries. In the same way that countries that used to have vaccine production, aka Canada, really regretted it once COVID rolled around and they couldn't produce their own vaccines anymore, countries, and by extension companies, are thinking pretty hard about about their supply chains for CPUs and AI training alike. But globalization has ensured that there is one major winner for the chip manufacturing, and that is TSMC. So I'm sure that momentum will carry Taiwan forward for quite some time. If you like this video, please hit subscribe. And then if you like, you can check out this previous video I made about seven hidden dangers of AI from the perspective of a cyber PhD. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.